This is Land of Havila, Matthew 8. Jesus just finished the Sermon on the Mount. Now some amazing events, one after the other. As usual, there are so many things on which we could comment. All we can do is skim the surface. Verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Behold, a leper came to him and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I want to be made clean. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus said to him, See that you tell nobody, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Comment. The leper said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. The Gospel of Mark adds that when the leper said that, Jesus was moved with compassion, and according to both accounts, Jesus then reached out, touched him. No one else but Jesus could have touched a leper. And Jesus said, I'm willing, be cleansed. Many people today have conditions that are untouchable except by the Lord Jesus Christ. Untouchable because no one else can help them. And we wonder many times, why isn't Jesus moved with compassion again? Why doesn't he touch them as well? We can answer that he's always moved with compassion, and if he hasn't removed the condition yet, it's for some greater and higher good, as when Jesus said, quote, This sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God, that God's Son may be glorified by it, John 11, 4. Every time we see an incurable condition today, one that Christ has not yet touched, an entrenched condition that won't go away by prayer or anything else, It's a testament to the glory of God that Christ showed when he did heal and that he shows when he does heal. If he didn't leave people in a condition like that for long periods of time, we wouldn't appreciate the times when he does heal or when he did heal. So each condition, whether healed or not, is a testament of his glory and a reminder that he did heal and that he'll eventually heal all conditions, quote, The dead will be raised incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Mark also adds that Jesus told the leper to tell no one about the healing, but, quote, he went out and began to proclaim it much and to spread about the matter so that Jesus could no more openly enter into a city, but was outside in desert places, and they came to him from everywhere, end quote. So the healing created a lot of personal problems for Jesus and his disciples. Afterwards, they couldn't go openly into a populated area, but rather had to stay in deserted places. Nevertheless, Jesus decided to perform the healing, though he knew it would be at his own great personal cost. And we might assume that in some cases today, when Christ doesn't heal, a healing would create some negative consequences that we didn't anticipate. As an example, King Hezekiah lived an exemplary life. Then one day he fell deathly ill, and God told him it was his time to pass on, that his illness would be fatal. But Hezekiah begged to live, so God healed him and granted him an extension of 15 years to his life, 2 Kings 20, verse 6. But when Hezekiah got up from his sickbed, he immediately did something he regretted, 2 Kings 20, 12 through 18. This was after a lifetime of not embarrassing himself. So maybe it would have been better if he had passed on, Maybe it would have been better if he hadn't been healed. Verse 5. When he came into Capernaum, a centurion came to him, asking him, and saying, Lord, my servant lies in the house paralyzed, grievously tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having under myself soldiers. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell another, come, and he comes. And tell my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Most certainly, I tell you, I haven't found so great a faith, not even in Israel. I tell you that many will come from the east and west, and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven but the children of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, let it be done for you as you have believed. His servant was healed in that hour. Comment. A centurion is a Roman soldier of high rank with many soldiers under him. Since the centurion was a man of faith, God the Father looked on him with favor and instructed him. 
We marvel at the wise men who came to Jesus when he was an infant, somehow knowing that Jesus was the king of the Jews. We marvel how they got that revelation, living far away in the east, in some dark hole of a country where we wouldn't think that the light of God ever shines. But God shines on anyone, anytime, anywhere, as he pleases, Jew or Gentile. God shined on the Gentile centurion and educated him about Jesus, that Jesus had command of a multitude of angels, that he was so powerful he had no need to go to a place but could simply send his angels in the same way that the centurion could send someone out. Usually men marveled at Jesus, but in this case Jesus marveled at the man, that his faith was so great God the Father would instruct him to that extent. In verse 11, Jesus prophesied that Gentiles would enter the kingdom of God alongside Jews. Quote, Many will come from east and west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. End quote. The centurion would be one of them. In the last chapter, Jesus said many would go through a wide gate that leads to destruction, which might sound like complete annihilation, but in verse 12, he mentioned a place of outer darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth, so that indicates not annihilation, but conscious torment. Coming up, another incident, verse 14. When Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. She got up and served him. When evening came, they brought to him many possessed with demons. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. Comment. It's interesting that Peter was married. In verse 14, Peter had a mother-in-law, which means either that he was married or he was a widower at the time. We know he had a living wife at the time Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 9.5, and that Peter took her along in his travels. Paul said, quote, do we not have the right to the company of a believing wife, like the other apostles, and the Lord's brothers, and Cephas, end quote. Cephas is Peter. In verse 16, Jesus, quote, healed all who were sick, end quote. That does mean all, according to the Gospel of Luke. Speaking of the same evening, quote, when the sun was setting, all those who had any sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Chapter 4, verse 40. Because of the healings, the crowds were so crushing. Verse 18. Now when Jesus saw great multitudes around him, he gave the order to depart to the other side. A scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, allow me to first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Comment. Jesus paid a cost for being Jesus, and if we want to follow him, there's a cost for us as well. The scribe said, I want to follow you, having no idea about the conditions. And Jesus said, in effect, it won't be easy. We don't know whether the scribe followed or not. That wasn't really the point. The point is that you and I do give up some things to follow, but no worries, it's plenty worth it. Mark 10.30 and Matthew 13.46 The next man said, I want to follow you, but allow me to first bury my father. It's not clear whether the father, whether the father already died and the man needed to attend the funeral, or if the father's still alive and the man wants to stay home until he passes away. Either way, if we want to follow, the time is now. There's nothing more pressing than following Jesus. We have no choice. As Jesus pointed out, if we don't follow, we're dead men already. Quote, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Verse 23. When he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. Behold, a violent storm came up on the sea, so much that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. They came to him and woke him up, saying, Save us, Lord, we're dying. He said to them, why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? Then he got up, rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. The men marveled, saying, What kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Comment. We should have faith during the storms of life. After the storm, the disciples asked, What kind of man is this? 
That's the question we should ask ourselves during the storm. We should contemplate what kind of person Christ is during the storms of life, that he's all-powerful, that he's loving, that he has our best interests at heart, that he will intervene on our behalf, that he's in control, so we should stop worrying. We don't want him to say to us after the storm, oh, you of little faith. So let's not be chicken littles during a storm. Jesus was the example of what to do during a storm. He was confident so much that he slept through it. Verse 28. When he came to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, two people possessed by demons met him there, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that nobody could pass that way. Behold, they cried out, saying, What do we have to do with you, Jesus, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many pigs feeding far away from them. The demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of pigs. He said to them, Go. They came out and went into the herd of pigs, and behold, the whole herd of pigs rushed down the cliff into the sea and died in the water. Those who fed them fled and went away into the city and told everything, including what happened to those who were possessed with demons. Behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged that he would depart from their borders. Comment. In verse 28, after, after surviving the storm at sea, Jesus and his disciples arrived on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and as soon as they were getting out of the boat, Mark 5.2, there was another storm of a sort, a demonic storm, of two men severely possessed with demons. In Mark, at least one of them lived in a graveyard, homeless, sheltering himself in the tombs because of his demons. He had superhuman strength, quote, nobody could bind him anymore, not even with chains, because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the fetters broken to pieces. Nobody had the strength to tame him. Always, night and day, in the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and bowed down to him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, you Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, don't torment me. Mark 5, 3 through 7. It wasn't the man so much that ran up and said, Don't torment me. It was the demons in the man. The man had no way of recognizing Jesus by himself. The demons recognized Jesus, possessed the man so that he ran up, and the demons voluntarily manifested themselves to Jesus, begging for mercy because they knew Jesus would recognize them anyway. It's ironic that the demons tortured the man without mercy, but when it was their turn, they had the, they had the nerve to beg for their own mercy. Let's not give them any mercy when we have the chance to cast them out. If they manifest to us, let's tell them where to go. If they manifest within ourselves, then our instructions are, quote, resist the devil and he will flee from you, James 4, 7. If they manifest in others and we see it as they manifested themselves to Jesus, let's take it as a sign that they're afraid of us, that they know we have the power to cast them out. In verse 34, the citizens of that country beg Jesus to depart, Imagine the opportunity to have Jesus visit, but to reject him. Apparently, they resented the economic loss of about 2,000 pigs floating in the water, Mark 5, 3, and they didn't want any more economic damage, so it was a case of money being a hindrance. Jesus said, count the cost. If we had the vision to tally up everything we would lose on one side of the page and everything we would gain by following Jesus on the other side, the page would be lopsided on the side of the gain. Matthew 9 is next. You can find it easily at landofhavila.net. Matthew 9.